Hello Year 12, <clears throat> welcome to our second video uh, for the arguments for the existence of God. So in this video we're going to be looking at cosmological arguments. So the word cosmos um, means the universe, everything that we see and we perceive. And cosmological arguments have been put forward by various philosophers. Um, the main philosopher we'll be looking at is Thomas Aquinas. So the first thing to say is that we divided the arguments for the existence of God between observation, which is a posteriori, and reason, which is a priori. Teleological, we looked at last lesson, is a posteriori, but so is the cosmological. So, another form of a posteriori argument an argument that draws a conclusion based on observation. Problems, we said this last week with a posteriori arguments. We jump to a conclusion that may be false, but based simply on subjective experience, maybe missing pieces of evidence. Good things relies on evidence and seems to be telling us something new about the world. So the first thing to say is that the cosmological argument is another form of inductive a posteriori argument. And we said last time there are some issues with this. So, often people try and explain the cosmological argument with the idea of dominoes falling. Dominoes falling, causing other dominoes to fall. And the cosmological argument is seeming, uh, or, or sorry, aiming, to say, well, what caused the entire universe? What caused everything that we see around us? And the conclusion, obviously, is going to be God. But it's based on observation. So Aquinas is going to begin by looking at cause and effect in our world. So we've looked at this already. Aquinas scholastic thinker and he believed he could uh, discover logical proofs for the existence of God. And Aquinas is asking this, the world, well he's saying this, the world depends for its existence on something that's always existed. So the cosmological argument is incredibly similar, in fact almost almost identical to the prime mover argument which was put forward by um, oh, sorry, the, um, yes, the prime mover, apologies, uh, argument put forward by Aristotle. So in a nutshell, this is the argument. Through a posteriori observation, I can see that whatever begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe must have a cause, and this must be God. So Aquinas puts this forward in his five ways. These are five arguments for the existence of God in his book, The Summer Theologica. And the first three are cosmological arguments. They're called the unmoved mover, the uncaused causer, and the argument from contingency. So they're all three of them, the same argument, but they're just expressed in slightly different ways. So the unmoved mover, let's look at this. First premise, first uh, statement. Some things in the universe are in motion. It may be that all things in the universe are in motion, but we can at least say that some things are moving, like planets and the winds and technically everything on Earth because we are orbiting the sun. Next premise, a thing cannot move itself. This is quite interesting. What Aquinas is saying here is that to move requires something that came before you to move you. So if we see a rock moving, it must have been pushed 
or it must be that gravity is pulling it. But something can't just randomly move itself. Now you might say, well, a human body can, but actually a human body can't because you require food in order to give you the energy that allows you to move. And also you required your parents to move and to create you. Next premise, an infinite regress of movers is impossible. Now, an infinite regress means we asked what moved the stone. Well, what moved the stone was the thing that came before the stone. Well, then we asked, well, what moved the thing that came before the stone? Well, it was something else. Well, what moved that? Well, it was something else. Well, what moved that? Well, it was something else. Well, what moved that? Was something... That can't go on forever. There must have been something that doesn't require a previous mover. And this is an unmoved mover. And this is God. So this really is the same as the prime mover uh, Ford experiment or argument in Aristotle. Now, this is the same cosmological argument, but it's just laid out in his second way. It's called the first cause or the uncaused causer. Premise one, all things are caused. That means things exist because something else created or caused it. Now, a thing cannot cause itself. It's impossible to cause yourself. So we look at the stone again. The stone can't have caused itself because in order to cause yourself, that means you had to exist before you existed in order to cause your own existence. So that's not possible. So things are caused. And the things that cause things are also caused. And it goes back and back and back and back. So what caused the stone? Well, the stone was caused by the rock. What caused the rock? Well, the rock was caused by lava. Well, what caused the lava? Lava was caused by the... It can't go back forever and ever and ever and ever because then there would be no beginning, Aquinas says. An infinite regress means there's no explanation for why things got started to begin with. Therefore, there has to be an original cause that was uncaused, and this must be God. Third argument is the argument from contingency. Contingent being is something that exists because it depends on something else. Everything in the world is a contingent being. The only reason the lamp exists is because it's contingent on the lamp maker or the metal that made the lamp or whatever it is. Every human is contingent. The only reason it exists is because parents created them. The opposite of a contingent being is a necessary being. This is a being that has no cause and must exist. So premise one, many things in, in the universe may either exist or not exist and all the finites are called contingent beings. Now, each contingent being is created by something. That's what it means to be contingent. But the thing that created it must also be contingent. And the thing that created that must also be contingent. And the thing that created that must be contingent. So it's impossible for everything in the universe to be contingent. For then, why is there anything at all? There'd be no explanation for why things got started in the first place. Therefore, there must be a necessary being whose existence isn't contingent, and this is God. So Aquinas is first three ways. He believes that he has demonstrated the existence of God on a posteriori grounds based on observation of the world, observation of cause, observation of motion, an observation of contingency. And from this, he thinks he can draw an a posteriori inductive conclusion on what must be the case at the beginning of time. Many people, without knowing it, sort of agree with this argument because as soon as scientists claimed that the universe began with a Big Bang, many people asked, well, what caused the Big Bang? 
And science doesn't have an answer for this. I mean, science doesn't require an answer because science is only interested in the visible world and the visible world began at the Big Bang. But it's still something which um, perplexes people. What caused the Big Bang? And if we say, well, this caused the Big Bang, we can ask ourselves, well, what caused that? And what caused that? And what caused that? And Aquinas thinks the only way you can get around this is by saying that there's something that has always existed, which is God's. Now, we have another philosopher called Leibniz who makes a similar claim as Aquinas. And this is the idea of the principle of sufficient reason. And Leibniz states that everything which exists must have a reason or cause for its existence. So if something exists, there must be a reason why it exists. If a statement is true, there must be a reason why it's true. If something happens, there must be a reason why it happens. So you might want to think about this to yourself. Can anything exist without a reason or a cause? Now, Leibniz is going to say yes. Even for things which are eternal, such as the world, there still needs to be a reason for its eternal existence. You might disagree and say that something could have always existed. But Leibniz doesn't think so. So let's imagine this book is eternal. For this book to have always existed, it must have been copied from earlier versions of the book with no first copy. Why will this never lead us to a complete explanation? Well, we will always ask, why have these books always existed? Why were they written? So even if we study the earlier states of the world, this can't go back in an infinite regress. They can never tell us why the world itself exists. And therefore, there must be something outside of the world, outside of the universe, that explains the universe's existence. And this must be God. So, Leibniz says, the world must have a reason for existing. We cannot find this reason from within the world, and therefore the reason must be God. So, this is the cosmological argument. And it's criticised in many different ways. So this is William of Ockham's criticism, famous for Ockham's razor. So he criticises different premises and the, indeed the conclusion of the argument. So let's look at the first one. All things are caused. So he says, is there a necessary link between cause and effect? Maybe some things aren't caused. Maybe some things just appear out of nowhere. Maybe things just don't need a cause. Maybe it's simply that everything that we see needs a cause. Now, quantum physics suggests that actually cause and effect doesn't really work. Some things seem to appear out of nowhere. So maybe this argument is disproved by quantum physics. Premise three, an infinite regress of causes is impossible. Well, Occam says maybe an infinite regress isn't impossible. Maybe causes, cause, causes, cause, causes, cause, causes, goes back forever. Maybe the universe is infinitely old. Maybe the universe is in some sort of infinite loop where there's no beginning. This is the Eastern or Indian version of the, or understanding of the universe, that it's constantly being created and destroyed and there's no beginning. And third criticism, if we do assume that God has been uh, proven. What is this God that's been proven? It doesn't seem to be a perfect God. Might not even be one God, might be several. It might be a God who's caused the universe to exist and has no omnibenevolence, has no interest in its continued existence. So this is similar to the teleological argument where we said, even if it does work, has it proven the God that most Christians are familiar with? Now, Hume criticizes as well. Hume is an empiricist. He believes that we can't say anything that goes beyond our own senses, our own empirical experience. Instantly, that's going to have, uh, he's going to have problems with the cosmological argument because the cosmological argument says something about the beginning of time. And we have no experience of the beginning of time. We don't know 
what was happening then. And we don't know the laws of cause and effect were even operative at the beginning of time. He's also a skeptic, so he's challenging and doubting received opinions and beliefs. So Hume says that like causes resemble like effects. For example, if we look at a baby, this is the effect. What's caused the baby? Well, it's likely to be someone who looks like the baby. Things look like the things that caused them. If I decide to design a table, the table is going to look like my design. So like causes resemble like effects. We think of dominoes falling over. What causes the people to fall? It was another person. So effects tend to be like their causes. So the argument here is, what must God be like if he caused the universe? The universe is imperfect, it's limited, it's finite, it's full of pain and evil. So arguably, there must be a limited, imperfect, finite, evil God. Now you may disagree and say that actually God created a perfect world. In the beginning it was good, according to Genesis. And the reason it's imperfect is because of the fall from grace. The problem with this is this isn't philosophy now, this is theology. If we're bringing in stories from revealed law, then we're going outside of the philosophical um, considerations of the argument. Like effects look like like causes, and therefore an imperfect world, an imperfect God. Hume's second criticism, things in the universe might need causes, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the universe as a whole needs a cause. So I'll say that again, things in the universe need causes, but that doesn't mean everything, uh, sorry, the universe as a whole needs a first cause. And he says this, were you there at the beginning of the universe? You weren't, so you never saw a cause anyway, so you can't go beyond your experience. To Hume's second criticism, we have no experience of the universe being made. So it's an inductive leap that we're not entitled to, to go beyond the experience of our senses. Hume's third criticism, if the universe requires a first cause, why does this have to be God? Can't this simply be the universe itself? Can't it be that the universe has always existed? And this is a very interesting argument, and we're going to come on to this when we look at Russell. For Hume's third criticism, the universe could be its own first cause. Kant's criticism is very interesting. So let's look at this fish. Can the fish know through reason or through experience what the cloud is made of? And the argument here is no. And Kant isn't talking about fish, but Kant says that we can't go beyond the realms of our possible experience, both a posteriori and a priori. So we can't possibly know if God created the universe or if God didn't create the universe. He's not disagreeing with God. He's saying that this is just outside of our uh, possible knowledge. And Kant goes even further at some stages and says that, well, actually, cause and effect aren't in the world. They are ways in which we perceive it, in which case laws to do with cause and effect as we understand it can't be extended to the universe as a whole. So God is outside of human logic and reason. We cannot argue that he does or does not exist based on reason or observation. Okay, Martin Lee's criticism. Now, Martin Lee states that it's maybe unfair to put God into a category of his own, not requiring a cause and yet causing everything else. Now, this is a really interesting argument. So Martin Lee says that Aquinas has contradicted himself. His first premise is all things are caused. His conclusion is God isn't caused. Now that's a contradiction, because all things need a cause. 
So surely God needs a cause as well. So what caused God? So Martin Lee's criticism says it's not fair to say that everything in the universe needs a cause, but then God doesn't. That's not fair. You can't do that. You can't say that God is special and outside of the first premise. This is Rush Rees' criticism. Do we worship or respect people because they're powerful? Well, the answer is no. So Rush Rees' criticism is that what kind of God is it that the argument claims to approve him? It just seems to be a very powerful God. Why should we worship this God just because he's very powerful? It just seems to be some eternal energy. This isn't what we believe God to be. And it could even be sort of something completely entirely different, an evil God, Satan, who created the world. So do we worship this God because he's powerful? And I think personally, Rush Rhee has misunderstood Aquinas. Aquinas isn't saying that the cosmological or any of the arguments for the existence of God are enough by themselves. They don't prove the Christian God, but they do point us in the direction of a Christian God. It just requires other forms of knowledge as well, such as revealed knowledge, to get fully at the Christian gods. Now, Bertrand Russell's criticism. Bertrand Russell says the universe doesn't need an explanation. It just exists, and it's always existed. It's a brute fact. It doesn't need any further level of explanation. Any further level of explanation actually complicates things and potentially falls foul of Occam's razor, multiplying metaphysical entities beyond necessity. So Russell's criticism is the universe just exists. It doesn't need a cause. And this gets complex. So. Russell says the universe just exists. It's its own reason for existence. There's no further explanatory level. Now, a religious person will say, well, we need God to explain the existence of the universe. But then the atheist will turn around and say, who created God? Who caused God? And the theist will respond by saying, God just exists. He's always existed. He's a necessary being. And Russell is saying, well, if you're going to end this causal explanation with a necessary being who doesn't need a cause, why not end it one step sooner with the universe and just say the universe doesn't need a cause? If you're going to say God doesn't need a cause, then why don't you just say the universe doesn't need a cause? So then the argument comes down to which one is easiest to um use to explain the world the universe just exists accept it or god just exists accept it and swinburne says that god is the better option here because it provides personal explanation now bertrand russell would disagree and say just because there's a personal level of explanation that doesn't mean the universe actually um has a creator god so which is simpler as a first explanation? The universe just exists, or God just exists? And Swinburne will say it's two, because it provides a personal level of explanation. Okay, this has been a slightly shorter video, because much of this has been covered, uh, the a posteriori argument section has been covered in the teleological um, video. Uh, thank you very much, Year 12. Next lesson will be the ontological argument.